Welcome to the Word and Journey podcast, conversations with friends about stories that shape us and make us think, and some stories that are just for fun. We're busy people reading books in realistic increments. Follow along in the book and join in the conversation, or just sit back and enjoy. Our aim is to unpack the story and offer you things to ponder. Either way, thanks for being here. Welcome to the Word and Journey podcast, stories that shape us and make us think and connect us with cool people and sometimes with ourselves as well. Uh, so today is uh, a, little, a little bit fun. So a little, a little bit of personal backstory. So for as long as I've been an Orthodox Christian, writing stories and talking with other Orthodox people about the stories I'm writing, the, the most consistent response I get is not actually, oh, what are you writing about? It's have you heard of, of Nicholas Kotar? Have you heard of Nicholas Kotar? <laughs> Have you heard of Deacon oh, Kotar? Like, he's got this podcast. He's got this writing. Uh, oh, no. So so for all of you out there, I, I did a thing. I, I went and heard of, of Nicholas Kotar. And <laughs> uh, uh, and now You're he's embarrassing me. <laughs> uh, yes, you've been preceded. So all to say. Uh, hi, Nick. How are you? <laughs> That's, I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for having me over. This is a Cool. I'm 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 excited about it too. Uh, so for the uh, two Orthodox people out there who who, who haven't heard of you <laughs> or your writing, um, could you say a little bit about what's your corner of the creative world? Yeah, I uh, I write I write epic fantasy inspired by Russian fairy tales, um, and I have a, a series of novels. I'm starting a new one soon. I have a podcast where I riff on sort of the cultural and spiritual importance of fantasy uh as a as a genre but uh all of this to say that i think i may have gotten much of it wrong um i'm i'm not even sure the fantasy is the thing that i do anymore and uh perhaps that's for a different conversation but um all that to say that even us uh who have even us creatives who have written things and have uh, gathered at least a bit of success we're always working on trying to figure out what it what it is that we're actually doing so it's an ongoing process <laughs> yeah I, I i love that exploration and the way that it gets to be a, a continual discovery uh although yeah. uh I'm, I'm really curious now so i guess what what does fantasy become for you as you dabble in its edges more often well i i found out this all started actually quite recently um I, i've been on a uh dr martin shaw binge um martin shaw is a folklorist but he's also a storyteller which is a difficult thing to manage to be both the analytical phd side of learning about fairy tales and stories and also tell them in a way that is absolutely brilliant and beautiful and and wonderful it's very difficult to do because those are two very different sides of your brain they're very two, two different kinds of creativity and more often than not, they get in the way of each other. And I can't tell you how many times I've encountered folklorists that really don't like stories. Uh, they're de they're deconstructionists. They're they're interested in the, you know, the the muscles and sinews. But in in the same way as as Pascal was interested in the insides of of animals, <laughs> you know, he didn't like dogs. He liked to vivisect them. Um, you know, that's that's often the the approach that a folklorist takes to folklore which is unfortunate but he's not like that he's he's somebody who's able to hold that in in he talks a lot about myth as the thing that changes culture or the thing that culture needs in, in particular in this new weird space that we inhabit right now uh, as as western christendom of the old type dies around us um but then in addition to that i i got onto this guy named john truby who's a Hollywood script doctor and has had a um, basically a go-to text that's basically this, almost the same as Robert McKee's story, I, I suppose, in the Hollywood circles. Um, it's called The Anatomy of Story. He then uh, followed it up with the book called The Anatomy of Genre, which I'm reading right now. And in it, it's like, I've started to read it. It's a manifesto. It's, it's like a manifesto about life, but through the prism of how to write in genre specifically. And his description of fantasy as opposed to his description of myth made me think that I think I might actually be writing mythic fiction as opposed to fantasy in the modern sense. Um, all that to say that I'm not changing anything really, but the way I understand it 
might be a little bit more nuanced, might be a little more different. And it also might explain my um, dislike of the modern fantasy, fantasy genre, which is a problem for somebody who writes in it. But then perhaps it's not that maybe I don't even really write in it, or maybe it's not my primary genre. Maybe that's why I don't like the way that modern fantasy shows itself because it's not really the fantasy of Tolkien and Lewis who really might not have been writing fantasy at all. They might've been writing myth. That, so. that makes sense. And, and I can see where there, that becomes a really useful distinction again, in the way that words matter, words are powerful. They, they define things yep. like, like if I, and I, we had this conversation once, I think uh, when I thought I was writing more science fiction and then you introduced yep. me to the term science fantasy. And all of a sudden a whole yes. bunch of my things made more sense. I was like, Oh, yeah. I think I know how to write my stuff better. Again, not necessarily yeah. changing much, but being able to kind of like lean into more of like the specific elements that I was actually emphasizing. Right. So. You you had an instinct about where you wanted to go. And I, what I think I did is I gave you the, the technical language and the handbook to be able to do that in a way that you actually understand what you're doing. Uh, this this Anatomy of Genres book is exactly like that. It, it You know, in, in terms of bridging gaps between analytical and creative, it's a very difficult thing to do. It's very difficult for us rationalists to do especially us modernists and that's i think there's something really beautiful in that tension between the two and being able to transcend both you know not be too technical not be too creative but find that that magic magical point in the middle and transcending genre conventions is really part of that and one of the ways you can do that is um is by introducing other other genre elements into your story and kind of making it a multi multi-genre experience which readers really like they like to, to have their expectations simultaneously confirmed but also subverted uh, something that uh most of marvel phase four and star wars of the disney plus era does not understand <laughs> yeah there's a there's a very particular thing that those are uh and yes <laughs> which which again it's not not a bad thing and if that's what you want then cool but uh i, I know for me i am being drawn more to the things that are more complex or they have surprises in them yeah. or they have uh, I don't know, like, like, you know, like there's this like fusion cooking where they have like multiple genres. Yes, on yes exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I like that sort of thing. My, I, I don't think my wife would go for that. She's very much like, you know, this food is that food, that taste is that taste. And that, and it's, <laughs> each one is beautiful on their own. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't ever put tomato sauce in your Asian, Asian in your Asian dish. Yeah. <laughs> that That's a bit too chaotic for me, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's what I did when I was sev seven years old, seven years old. That was my, <laughs> that was my dip into fusion. <laughs> very nice. Uh, that's exciting. Um, okay, I so more reading for me. I'm I'm, I'm intrigued. The the anatomy of it's like of the genre. It's, it's like 600 pages. This this thing is a door stopper. So get ready to uh, okay. <laughs> buckle in. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that'll occupy me for the rest of my life. So it could. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. Well, speaking of stories, so I'm gonna introduce our topic or the topic that that I ran by you uh, for for today. So. Um, here, here's my. I actually wrote an intro blur, but uh, what makes a book good, or what makes for for good literature, uh, and how does a story grow from being a good book or a great one to earn the rank of classic literature? Is it by yeah. being a good plot, such as in uh, what I recently read, the the passage? Is it by building a fantastic world, like in Lord of the Rings, the books? Not necessarily the show. Um, is it by developing compelling and relatable characters, as in The Book Thief? Is the book great because the author does beautiful things with words, making each page beautiful just to look at, like in Cormac McCarthy's The Road? Or is it a great for the way the author teaches the reader to read a new language as they turn each page, as in Paul Kingsnorth's The Wake, which I'm reading now and really much enjoying? Uh, is it a good book because it's wildly popular, like The Game of Thrones? Or because it forces us to face our own ironies in edgy and offensive ways like Fight Club? Is it mm -hmm. a great because it's laden with metaphor like Picture of Dorian Gray? Or because it's old like the Odyssey? Or because it explores <laughs> deeply spiritual and philosophical things like in the Brothers Karamazov? Do great books require great heroes, clever villains, never before seen world elements? And the classics, classics, we has, because they've not yet finished all they need to say, saying all they need to say, uh, or are books good just because we like them? Uh, or yeah, oh my books... goodness. stop already. Good grief. There's okay, like okay. so much in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, I, I have a couple of thoughts, but I bet you carry it. So you think you've been around words a little bit longer than me. Oh, um, and then the, and then the other element to throw in it at some point is, uh, so me now reading as, as an Orthodox Christian too, I, I kind yeah. of feel like there's not like, there's no longer a neutral way to engage with stories. No, uh, no, there is so 
Well, there never was. Let's be honest. I mean, the we just become more conscious of it uh, w- when we become Christian be- because we understand in- instinctively how important what it, what a, what importance the role of story has, even uh, in recounting the history of our salvation. I mean, it's the what's really fascinating um, about all of the biblical accounts, all the way from Genesis to um, uh, to Re- Revelation is y- it provides almost in some sense a template for for different experiences of genre. Um, there's a wonderful book called The Art of Biblical Narrative by uh, Robert Alter that I very much recommend. Um, he's he, he writes not for Christians. Um, he's not a Christian himself. He writes for a, for a secular academic audience. But if you carefully um, parse his argumentation. The kind of things he says are really fascinating and very profound, in the sense that there are pretty much all literary, as a novelistic genres that you can imagine in the many different books of the Bible, almost as though these are the real life uh, archetypes of what all literature is trying to aspire to. And Tolkien talks about this, of course, in in uh, more specifically about the resurrection story being a an archetype of the hero's journey or of the fairy tale or of um, the myth uh, in general. Um, that's a bit of a of an of a uh, oversimplification, but it certainly is true that within that greatest story ever told, there you have the, all the beats that even Aristotle talks about in his poetics. Uh, so there's something about so what I want to get to is that there's this, we've already started talking about this, that there is this really interesting reality that I think people downplay a lot, uh, whether they're Christian or not, doesn't even matter, that there are story forms that are kind of some, something like the platonic forms. Um, and these could be genres, they could be conventions, they could be tropes, but they're more than that. And when they are embodied in the lives of the saints, in uh, in sacred scripture, um, incarnated as, as a kind of uh, s- extension or subset of the incarnation of the word, capital W. This is a smaller incarnation of the word, small w, the logos. Um, you start to see that there's something about stories, something about storytelling that is not necessarily sacred in the sense that people like to talk about, like the goddess within, that sort of sacred, but in the sense that it is part of the human aspiration towards the divine. It's a part of uh, there's something about it that allows us actually to uh, inhabit our likeness. That there's something about storytelling that can help us in the growth of our likeness. Not a very popular um, point of view, by the way, amongst fund- fundamentalist Christians of all stripes, not just Orthodox, but Protestant and all kinds. But I think there's something very important that needs to be said about this, that um, that there are archetypes, that there are, mm, that there are forms in the secular literature, you call they're, they're called genres. They're called conventions. They're called tropes. But I think there's something more. There's something about the experience of being human in a fallen world, as reflected in the sacred, that can help guide our uh, earthly attempts at meaning making through the word, of bringing down meaning out of chaos through writing on a piece of paper, to be some somewhat reflective of the greatness that is found in our experience of God as reflected in, in scripture. So what that means is that there needs to be always, there's no such thing as the perfectly creative act in the sense of complete freedom as the postmodern person would like there to be as the gender theory types talk about uh, the, in, the sort of imposition of meaning onto self, right? This cannot exist in storytelling and everybody understands this. In- instinctively, because the stories that are the that endure the longest tend to have elements that repeat, tend to have some aspect of convention, some aspect of genre, some aspect of model that harks to something else before it or after it. And there's something about sticking to that model, whatever that model might be, and then also allowing for the the personal. Um, for, for the personal reality of creativity to pass through that convention that creates this tension between the, the perfectly creative and the perfectly conventional and 
to make a long story short, I think all classic fiction has some element of that. So to answer the question about is it this, is it that, is it that, is it that, with all the beautiful things you said about all those beautiful works of fiction, of, of literature, the answer is yes. It's not <laughs> any one of them. It's yes. But how that happens is... Uh, a tension, a, a a song, a dance, a harmonization of uh, of the the chaos that exists or the tension that exists between total formalism and total freedom. That makes sense. I think so. Uh, um, I am I hear I hear a lot of things. So, so the the, the spectrum of rigidity and chaos comes to mind, and it's. Uh, It's, I talk about this in, in a counseling context in a little bit different way, talking around uh, like lifestyle and, and behavior patterns. I mean, you can be like super rigid or regimented. Yep. Yeah. And uh, like kind of like the 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 extreme of ritual, or it could be yes. Super... Or ri so, ritualism, ritualism, <clears throat> not, not ritualism. ritual, but ritualism. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Or or on the other end, just very very chaotic, which. Uh, you know, and sometimes they're the responses to each other. Like I'm coming yeah. from chaos, so I'm embracing ritualism, or I've yep. been in too rigid a structure, so I want freedom. But because I've been, I've been in the forms altogether, I end up with yes. chaos. And I think what I'd love to hear a little bit more about is the way, because uh, it sounds like you were talking about how stories can be that form for us, so they can mm -hmm. be that yeah. framework, yeah. Um, telling us who we are, how to be, how to live. Uh, yes. No, I, I definitely think that's true. Um, that this is this is a really interesting topic. It's not something that I know much about, but it's something that that I like to think about a lot. Um, it's it's not. I don't. Uh, you're a therapist. You understand. It's not surprising in the place that we are, in the world that we are, in the culture that we are, that people have such a hard time understanding who I am, who who we are, and why there's so much premium placed on the search for the authentic self, right? But the the more we go into this search for the authentic self and the further away we get from any sort of cultural roots, however, they, however, whatever cultural roots you might have, I mean, America is a very young country. It doesn't even have roots, but you know, everybody's an immigrant from somewhere. So the further you get away from those immigrant roots, the further you get away from the old country, the more it seems like we're getting into this pervasive chaos where it's whatever you want. And as though that would, you know, you can be whatever you want. You can impose meaning on, on the world around you because the world itself is a kind of construct. But that's all fine and dandy in the hallowed halls of academia. But you know, it, when you're talking to somebody who's suffering, when you're in a room with someone with very serious trauma, that's that doesn't help. You're not going to tell that person, go and write your story because you have to give that person the rules to do that properly. You have to give mm -hmm. that person the, the template. Otherwise, the just the sheer weight of that, I mean, the weight of self-authoring, that is that is a tremendous, tremendously difficult thing to do. How can you possibly write a concrete thing about all the many different crazy things that you are, all the experiences that you've had, all the things you've gotten gen from genetics, all the things that you've gotten based on the relationships that you've had, all the pain, all the good? How can you possibly even start with it? I mean, this is why so many new writers have trouble with you know i'm moving away from the from the therapeutic but talking about that's why so many you know beginning writers have trouble with the blank page because how can you possibly wrangle all of that into mm -hmm. something that is that as concrete and, and discreet as all that that's why it's helpful that's why mm -hmm. it's helpful to have the conventions the genre uh, gives you you know the the three act structure the seven beat plot the the 15 points of each genre and I'm, I'm, this is from the book but the anatomy of genre there are from 15 to 20 beats in every single genre that you have to all of which you have to absolutely have otherwise the reader will instinctively recoil from your story there's mm -hmm. a lot of freedom in initially especially when you're when you're just starting in knowing that there is a way that you can do this that will at least take care of the basics you're probably not going to create you're not probably not going to express your best, more true, most true self. You're not going to be the most authentic. You're not going to write a classic, in other words, uh, on your first time around. You're not going to you probably even tell a very good story. Mm -hmm. But the expectation that you should uh, is one that is imposed on you by modernity. In, in the past, it was entirely expected that you would go through apprenticeship, even as an oral storyteller, which which would seem to be like a very simple storytelling form. I just tell stories around a fire, right? 
But no, there is a deep thousand year old tradition and you have to be you have to be taken through it by somebody who's gone through it before. Same thing is true of, of writing it down. So mm -hmm. there's something very, very uh, important about having that, having those initial rules with, by which to abide um, that oddly enough tend to be consistent throughout time. Like to tell a good story, it doesn't matter where in the world you live and what time period you live. You know, if you, if you look at these sort of um, the Chinese epics, they're very different from ours, but there are certain elements and aspects of them that are actually quite similar. You just have to see it from it from a from the right perspective. Mm -hmm. And the the folklorists talk about how it's very strange that you have certain beats, story beats, story tropes, story conventions in fairy tales throughout the globe. That even though you might have a very distinct African uh, series of stories that reflect that that focus more on less on heroic Western. European ideals are more than the trickster figure, for example, like in the Anansi stories. Still, you you do have certain rhythms that you will find anywhere, uh, and it tend more likely than not you're going to find more similarities and differences, especially if you're open to it. If you're not somebody who's completely focused on the fact that if it's a different culture, they can't possibly be any similarities, which is a different question, kind of a going yeah. off a little bit on the rails. Yeah, I, I think you hear that though, where. Uh, in, in one sense, what makes a story good is the way that it can uh, exist within its current form, and that there could be it could the form could be anything because um, yes. there's a lot of different genres, a lot of different beat structures. Um, but it yeah. sounds like a, a good story can work with those beats in a really in a really good way. And I'm I'm thinking of um, I'm gonna try try to try to make a music metaphor. Like they, they, there's a, there's a way where if I'm playing in the key of G, there's certain conventions mm -hmm. to that key. There's you know one sharp and you know. I mean, musicians know what that means. Um, yes, <laughs> and and there's endless things that I can do within the form of these. These are the keys that are allowed, and uh, and, and I'm I'm reflecting on this as uh, as I've developed as a writer. And you know, mm -hmm. it started out very much just like, well, I know what I know what I like to read, and I'm kind of going with my gut. And hey, oh, this looks cool. And like my first story was this really clunky super way too emotive, like three hundred thousand word thing that. Um, I'm gonna hopefully go back to you at some point and actually do it right. You you better. <laughs> I will. Yes, yes, I will. Um, but um, but what and what it, what I discovered um, and, and you helped me with this with this some um, was discovering here's here's some structure here's some mechanics here here's the names of some of these mechanics and 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 to uh, affirm this they they didn't limit my creativity at all and I feel like they actually focused it and enhanced it. Yeah, you know, in a way, we're at a disadvantage. In in our freedom-loving culture, we're taught that we don't need convention. Um, so what we need, to, what we as storytellers need to do, is kind of actually move in a backwards direction, very often before we can start writing well. Um, because, and this is especially true of the latest generation. I, I teach at a at a seminary where you know, basically all the kids are Gen Z, and the the reality is that that school the schooling that they're getting by and large is not giving them any sort of structure and the you know on the one hand they might enjoy it a lot more perhaps than they did than we did or, or the, the generation before did but they don't have any structure to their thinking so they think that they know everything that there is to know so there's a lot of unlearning that needs to happen for for the modern storytelling which was not the case in the more repressive times of the past where you understood that you had to go through the motions first that you have to you have to reflect the the forms of your elders in in all things storytelling included and that was just part of the thing so they were three four five steps ahead of us because they could do the uh the difficult and, and sometimes annoying job of simply parroting uh repeating the the things that their elders do just to learn how it's done and then through that to be able to express themselves already in a more authentic way by injecting their own experiences their own uh, creativity, their own experience with the world into those forms that they have already learned. But we need to unlearn in a lot of ways the the fact that we don't know anything and we don't know it. Uh, you and I are, are not Gen Z. We we are still lucky enough that we we were immersed in a kind of storytelling tradition that still reflected the forms in some sense. I mean, we, we grew up with Star Wars. We grew up with with the classics uh, to, to some degree. We understand instinctively what works, right? So what you were, you what you what explained about your big sprawling 
thousand word epic was that <laughs> you your instincts as a storyteller were right, but they were informed by the stories that you grew up with and they were good stories. But now you don't have, you're not even allowed to make that qualification about what's good and what's not. Uh, I was told straight up that any sort of ob objective uh, valuation of storytelling is um, passe and wrong. And I was told that I'm I'm not allowed this is by a very successful writer. Uh, I was told that you you cannot say you cannot say that there's objective standard for good storytelling. You must not because it only depends on the taste of the reader, which is nonsense. It's it's absolute ahistorical mm. BS. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's very stupid. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's that's uh, get into the kind of kind of the question I was bringing is because uh, I I have that I perceive that as well that a lot of art in general there's a subjective quality to it there's a very personal quality there is a very well like the way that i experience this as my individual my individual context really informs this so that element is very present um yeah and what it would have come to wonder and again and this is me also now being informed by 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 you now my, my my orthodox framework which it which definitely says there there are some definite things uh yeah you know so if, if there objective is standard, realities yeah yeah, so I guess I guess that's what I'm a little bit curious about is what do you see are some of the more objective realities within storytelling and literature? I mean, I, I would I would um, recommend that you read uh, and your listeners read a wonderful um, essay by Italo Calvino, um, who's a 20th century. I don't think he's alive anymore, um, but he's he's might even want to have won the Nobel Prize in the 20th century. But he's one of the great luminaries of literature in the 20th century um, and a professor of, of literature as well. He he has an essay called uh, Why Read the Classics. And he's got this list that is very comprehensive and very good. Uh, I'm not going to go through it. Um, I actually have a series uh, of, of videos on it um, uh, called, uh, oh gosh, what, what's it called? Something about unifying stories in a dark time. But it, I talk about, I would talk about it there in more detail. But again, the answer to that question reflects a certain tension between personal um, taste and something outside it, something that uh, that is very difficult to define, some sort of objective standard that doesn't depend on time or or the personal tastes, even of the tastemakers. This is what's interesting. It seems like there are certain stories, certain books, uh, certain types of literature that uh, when done well within the strictures of the genre, but also when written by somebody who is a genius in the sense of this person has has managed to do something transcendent within the forms by subverting them, by doing them better than anybody else, by writing beautiful language, by somehow injecting a, a incredibly powerful theme, some, something like this. Um, those are those are the those two realities, right? The the strict and the free kind of have to come together in a way. That's one thing to create something that's that within the lifetime of the author, mo most of the time, not always, most of the time, has an has an effect that reaches beyond uh, his small circle of influence, shall we say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the passage of time has to validate that as well. And there's something about this. It, it's a bit ineffable. It's a bit hard to describe, and it's sometimes only visible from a from a large distance. There's something about the classics that makes them classic. Something about you know, the, some works of, of uh, Charles Dickens that are going to last longer than others. And you can tell. But you can only tell when you're within it, when you've done the work of actually reading. So to really understand and to be able to answer this question, you have to actually read all the classics. That's the that's the only way you're going to understand the answer fully, it by, is by going through the comprehensive list. And I'm mostly talking about Western uh, culture here. Uh, because when we're talking about the objective... Um, when we're talking about the transcendence of literature as an art form, we're talking about a Western art form. Um, literature in the West uh, tried to do something that no other culture in the in history ever really tried to, and the reason that it meaning that it tried to encapsulate the fullness of human experience in a concrete written form. Um, that's not something that was done in pre-literate cultures for obvious reasons because people didn't write, and not a lot of people read. Right, so it was—it's a very small historical reality in terms of in terms of the the vastness of human experience that where this was even attempted. And my argument is that it's only possible within a culture that is informed by the uh, transcendent message of Christianity, which is that matter itself can be transcended, and all the things that we do can reflect 
uh, the creator who gave us that desire to reflect him. Um, so because that's true, because the the strivings even of atheist writers uh, are towards self or human transcendence towards something that they don't even understand perhaps. Uh, but always it's towards toward the, the good, the beautiful, the true, always. And if it's not, it's not classic. It doesn't doesn't last. Because of that, are, there's something... Sorry, go are ahead. You talk, that's okay. Are, are you talking about um, like good like the good stories or stories can become classic because in some fashion they're they're searching for the transcendent for the for the bigger than just me for the good the beautiful yep. where stories that maybe uh spurn that or ignore that or, or don't reach for that probably don't have potential to become true classics well it's it's really interesting because if that were the strict uh um definition of it then something like no country for old men would would probably have to be called bad literature i just read it for the first time i think it's one of the greatest novels of the of the 20th century I th I think it will be a classic, and the reason is that there is a way of of painting uh, an image of the transcendent through the absence of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not it's not a nihilistic story. It's it's a it's a story of deep and profound um, pain uh, for the sins of this country, for the sins of individuals and the society at large, um, and for the for it's it's a it's a kind of cry out a cry of the heart within the reality of a world that has a god-shaped hole that being said there are things that consciously really try to subvert those things invert them put them away something like the boys right um which will never be classic so no matter how many people enjoy watching that the the amazon prime show um it will never be a classic it will not transcend the test of time because it is it's a very very specific expression of a very specific kind of nihilism <laughs> that mm. cannot survive and really even something like if you talk about somebody like nietzsche right who was a kind of you know prophet of nihilism even he's going to test stand the test of time because he recognized the striving towards the transcendent he he were he thought that it would come out through the ubermensch and he knew that he would never be the Ubermensch, but still he understood that it's not possible for humanity to be stuck in something as dirty and awful and self-referential and just dirt awful as the world of the boys, for example. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That is really interesting. So it's making me think of some other things. So <clears throat> um, I haven't seen the boys. <laughs> Maybe I'll skip it now. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> not worth um, it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but another story that, that, I, that I've played with some, uh, and we did some episodes about it here is, uh, is the fight club story. Uh, yeah. and it's, you know, the, the, the uh, for definitely the book, I mean, the movie's kind of its own experience, but, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, this debate we were having is could fight club potentially have classic potential because it just like, you know, super interesting and all of that. Yeah. And so, and, and I don't know, and I'm not, I'm not going to die, die in this mountain, but I, but I wonder because it does have these very nihilistic traits to it but especially in the book if you dig into it there that does feel like there is this awareness of the absence of the transcendence uh, and they're yeah. the way the characters go there's i don't know i kind of described it as like almost as like parody of like orthodoxy in the way that people yeah. are kind of seeking redemption yeah. in these really destructive chaotic ways but like they're right. they're, they're seeking mm -hmm. something and so so i don't know yeah. it, 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 that, that, that's no i mean i i haven't read it and I've, i only watched part of the movie and it it just wasn't it wasn't my kind of thing it got a little bit too much too too fast the movie did um so i just you know like there's only so many so many hours in your life that you have so <laughs> sometimes it's better to choose <laughs> to limit the things that you yeah, intake but yeah. um i'm curious i'm curious about the book because I, I get the sense from your conversations on that topic um that there there might be something to it there might be something to it that might give it classic status in the ultimate it's it, it, you know this is this is something that time will have to tell and it's also partially i mean not to say that it's all that it all has to do with the brilliance of the of the writer um th that used to be that's the sort of kantian way of looking at things where you know the genius of the writer and is the thing that that creates harmony in the world and therefore it's the or rather the, the creative impulse right so that's the thing that will cause it to be a, a classic or not no not only there has to be a reception too there is a critical element in in the reception of the thing amongst the people some things that are very that were quite beautiful and quite wonderful 
um, never become classics just because they were they somehow didn't hit a chord. Um, you know, it's it, there's there's a lot of wonderful fiction in the 19th century written by wonderful authors, um, and some people would would prefer sort of the unknown favor the unknown uh, non classics that that belong to the, the the you know the George Eliot or the or the Charles Dickens or whatever. But you know, time has spoken, uh, and the critical reception is that critical in the sense that all the people who have read it. Uh, mm. say that no this is not a classic so there it's it's a very difficult thing to answer but i kind of i'm okay with that tension a lot of people aren't a lot of people want to have the, the the specific and very precise definition but i'm okay with that uh with that being a kind of um creative tension and to, so you know some yeah. things become classics we can sort of tell why but we sort of don't know why sometimes <laughs> yeah which which kind of makes sense and, and again and yeah now now coming from from within the, like, like the orthodox framework there there's a, there's a lot of things that we, we we know to be true even if we don't fully understand why and we kind of just like leave it uh so yeah. yeah some some stories end up as classics and kind of recognized as such for mystical reasons well you know leaving it might not might not even be all that useful i mean it might it might be a good for us modern people to kind of just contemplate the tension like to be inside the paradox for a bit you know like just just let it let it be and just accept that some things aren't going to be logically equivalent that it's okay um because that really i mean if we're honest all of human experience is a series of paradoxes that are very difficult to reconcile um mm -hmm. i mean how is it that we can you know find one human being to love and, and to marry and then to be consistently um faithful to and then how is it that we can give so much love to to these children who who you know are absolute incarnations of chaos you know like there's <laughs> it doesn't make sense it you know and you can you can you can put all kinds of funny labels like you know instinct or, or evolution or blah 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 on all of these things but those are just names that don't mean anything really uh mm -hmm. unless you're inhabiting that reality and just kind of letting it wash over you and understanding that in that tension that's where the magic is <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And which again, feels very, very true to life too. There, there's a lot of just paradoxical experiences and, yeah. uh, and, and I mean, maybe it's a more Western thing to, to want that hard and fast label. Um, yeah. And it just may not exist, which, which can be fine. Could be, could be good for us to encounter some of that tension and discomfort. Well, perfect. Perfection is ever increasing. I think. So if you're, if you're, if you're reaching towards it um, and you think that you're going to find something in a tidy, equation then you know your view of perfection is not very interesting in my, as far as yeah I'm concerned. yeah yeah well so so speaking of that so so thinking back to 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 the forms and uh, you know uh, throwing out this this music metaphor of you know i can i can perfectly play in the, in the key of g which works uh until you factor in like accidentals and jazz mm -hmm. and uh, and things yep. like that uh and and it's and it's beautiful and and even in yeah. a sense like orderly and I was thinking yes. about uh, there. There's a, a conversation um, you'd had with uh, you know Jonathan Pajot around weird storytelling, and yeah. uh, so it, within kind of what you were talking about about there, there's these forms, there's these genre beats that are, are kind of essential. Uh, what would you mm -hmm. say then becomes the role of uh, breaking the genre? Or yeah, uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. No, I mean it's this also depends on on sort of the culture that you live in. Um, I've, I've been thinking about it in, in this really, I think it's an interesting, uh, dichotomy that was introduced also by, by Martin Shaw. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if he said it explicitly, but I think he did. Basically, it's something like we're always moving between in, in story, in the way we tell story, we're always moving between Camelot and the green chapel, right? And Camelot is like the perfect, um, expression of what is orderly on earth. Right, the perfect expression of the perfect government, the perfect society, the perfect story, the perfect interaction between human beings. That's Camelot, right? That's that's the round table, the table that doesn't have any edges, and you know where you can be, where everybody can be equal and hierarchical at the same time, right? And the the Green Chapel is the thing that challenges the ritualism of that the Camelot will inevitably go to, right? Because if you're always in the in the orderliness as a human being that is that who is constantly changing and moving and, and dynamic then that can become something that that starts to 
loop in on itself and become a problem, right? That's the problem with ritualism as opposed to ritual. So the Green Chapel, the coming of the Green Knight, the what the infusion of the wild into the orderliness of Camelot is something that is especially necessary when um, when Camelot has become corrupt, right? It's it's often imagined in you know, the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight as the story is in some sense imagines Arthur not as a young man who's recently become married to Guinevere, but Arthur as an older man whose nephew is already, to, you know, uh, old enough to be, to be a, uh, a knight. So this is, this is Camelot perhaps at its peak, but tending towards corruption, right? Mordred is not there, not there yet, but he's on the horizon. He's going to come soon. So the infusion of the wild in, in the sense of telling stories, and that's what I was talking about with Jonathan in the strange stories, the storytelling podcast is I think there's something to, um, expressing the forms a chaotic way like trying out breaking them subverting them but not for the sake of the subversion but for the sake of the form so changing the expectations that people have moving or even and technically speaking it might be something as simple as moving around the beats in a way that's unexpected for people so like ha have the you know have the success of the of the heroic quest early in the story for example in which case you think, oh, the story is over, but then suddenly it's a totally different story. It's a story of dealing with success, which is not the heroic quest at all. It's a different, it's an entirely different kind of story. Or it could be that there is yet another disaster on the, on the horizon, and the ultimate success is going to be something that you never expected, something that's even greater, but something that's hinted at at the beginning, right? So um, the the way I see this right now for myself as a writer, which perhaps is the the easiest way to talk about it, is I'm curious to see how I can take the the form of fantasy fiction now, as it as it exists now, which is which is a form that I think is very dull. It's got a lot of dragon writing. It's got a lot of political squabbling. It's got a lot of um, TNA. Pardon me. Pardon the French. Um, it's got a lot of gratuitous violence. It's got a lot of nihilism. It's got a lot of kind of formulaic stuff that's happening. That's very annoying and a lot of magical world building that is there for the sake of the magical world building that I just hate um, because it's not actually in any real sense. Uh, illuminating, illuminating a reality or a truth about human existence just there for the sake of the magic system. Like, what cool thing can we come up with next? I think that's like Camelot's crumbling. And whatever we, we had with the coming of, of Tolkien and the introduction of this wonderful new form, I think it's it's getting to a point where it's quite dull, which is why you have really interesting voices telling very different kinds of fantasy stories like N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth Trilogy, which is a fantastic story, you know, and you have the you know, Rebecca Roanhorse uh, is, is an author that, that's uh, uh, Native American, got some really wonderful stuff. You're seeing a lot of really bizarre, chaotic stuff that's going beyond the sort of Western European um, uh, grunge medieval thing. Um, so on the, so that's one way of doing it is kind of changing the setting, but I'm more interested in changing the form. Uh, bringing it back to what it should be, which is about, you know, sort of inner, uh, finding the inner transcendence through the quest. So, how, mm -hmm. so for me, that means like going going deep and back and finding out how the story forms did it in the old days, like how how the fairy tales are structured and why. And is there a way of telling the story in a way that's more fairy tale like? Because the fairy tale it has a way of kind of obscuring forms a way of getting you sucking you into a different a different uh secondary world entirely one that you don't know what the rules are going to be because it's crazy and wild and unexpected especially in, in russian fairy tales so that's what i think we need to ex explore as storytellers is there a way that we can kind of go out outside of the conventions of genre but still within the um the world of storytelling as it has been given to us Right, so don't go way out there. I'm not talking about coming up with like a 21st century analog of, of stream of consciousness. Like, no, thank you. Like, that's fine. We we don't need any of that. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. we need something else. Something that's that's an infusion of the wild of the Green Chapel, but still reflective of what Camelot wants to be. We don't want to yeah. like. This is why I hate the the Green Knight movie so much. Is because it it's a it's basically a uh, an artillery fire attack at Camelot. Like, it's it's not a story about how the wild can reinfuse a certain sense of freedom or, or unpredictability or potential into the orderliness, the excessive ritual of, of Camelot. It's about destroying Camelot for the sake of destroying Camelot. Mm. It's the same thing as the boys. It's just, no. <laughs> yeah. Please. 
next step. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think I can see the difference of um, yeah. There, there, there's these forums, and the forums taken to their extreme could become rigid, could become corrupted, and begin to cause their yeah. own kind of damage. But yeah. uh, abandoning the forums just to abandon them, or sometimes because you're angry at them. Uh, well, I mean, yes. in, I mean, in, in real life, as as like young adults develop, there there can be this yes. way of yeah rebellion. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Well, well, either. I could, as an as a young adult, I could just like blindly, unthinkingly adhere to. Well, here's the tradition that yeah. I've been handed, even if it's a good tradition, yes. and it, yes. and it doesn't really change me. I just kind of become a cog in it, or I yeah. could angrily become the opposite, kind of rigidly become the opposite, and call myself free, even though I'm mm -hmm. I'm stuck in the opposite. Versus yep. what sounds like you're talking about is this more intentional, maybe more difficult to hit middle ground where I'm saying, well, it's much more difficult to hit. Yeah, it's much here's more, my because it's so yeah. dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. Like here's my assigned beats. There's the established conventions. Can I try a different combination, but still keep the same beats? And right. not because I hate the forms, but because I'm interested in seeing how can they grow, how can I develop them? And it's also getting back to one of your original questions about the about the personal expression aspect of it. The best way that you can subvert the conventions is by being is by reflecting not your truth in the in the sort of icky sense, but the the authentic reality of who you are as a human being in this place and time which me which is going to be different from everything from everybody else so infusing that dynamic and uh into the rigidness of the forms can create something quite beautiful but there's a problem there because if you are a human being that is not all that interesting and i'm sorry this is something you have to <laughs> you know, be, be aware of yeah. you might be you might be a dull human being who has not developed himself or herself enough uh and if that's the case then your personal version of uh, or your personal subversion of the forms is going to be garbage <laughs> maybe well wait with that though and, and i was appreciating i mean you talked about uh it's really good for writers to like go outside and like you know touch trees and touch grass yes and, like encounter nature you know and get to encounter people uh, which uh, you know, I, I completely agree. I mean, uh, there, yeah, we we need to <laughs> the way we know ourselves best when we're in community. We we understand ourselves best when we're out out in the world. Uh, yeah, the, the the variable could be, I think, if if say like you just are like inside a lot, or maybe don't have a really big community or a lot of access to nature. Um, yeah. being really in touch with like your own in, inner conflicts and. Because there, I mean, the inner world is pretty vast and pretty interesting, and yes, and there's there's a lot of ways we can hide from it or numb it out or just not really understand it. But uh, I think if you are able to really know, like here's here's the the human conflicts as they're playing out with like with within the inner world, uh, there'll yeah. be a little bit that's skewed. Yeah, that's really great. Absence, yeah, no, no, so. that's really beautiful because what you're talking about in in therapeutic language is what happens for, to the ascetic um, in 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 his cell. So to speak, right? So if if we're you know pushing this into the into the realm of the religious or just the realm of the human, it's true we are a, a boundless infinity within us in some sense because we are created in the image of, of God. So if there is a way that we can descend, you know, inside in a productive and creative way, then we can do an, an amazing thing uh, in terms of developing our uh, authentic self. Um, that's just really, really hard. It's really hard in the in the absence of a community, in the absence of rooted culture. That's extremely difficult because we are so peppered with distracting thoughts, with realities that are superficial. We don't really have a practice of descending deep. Um, that's something that needs to be cultivated with help from somebody else. Yeah, yeah. That that inner world is hard. That, that's kind of why, like, I have a full time job. So yeah, right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. No, that 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 gives me a lot to think about in terms of um, th things to watch for. And I and I really appreciate uh, you taking kind of my, my initial question and uh, stepping into the this more meta perspective of saying, yeah, it's not about specifically like you know this genre or like world building versus character building, but about you know how do how does one relate to the forums, which becomes yeah. kind of a way of how do I use these forums to relate to the transcendent to the divine, uh, which then becomes a way of like how do I how do I understand myself in this how do I stand, how do I understand others and and also how do I become more me, how do I become a a, a more human being, mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's that's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, 
which is really great. Um, yeah, that might be that might be that might be what my head can contain at the moment. So uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. It's it's a lot to sue over. I mean, there there. I mean, there's other things. Uh, I know the other question we kind of teased out was like uh, also as parents, like as I'm. Uh, well, it's, it's most of my wife that's like doing the homeschooling, but like I mean, I yeah. have like a peripheral presence on that. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> but, but yeah, but like part of the questions that's come up is like you know picking stories, and you know I mean yes, there's this kind important. of classic Christian parent conversation of like you know do our kids get to watch Harry Potter, and if so, when? Yeah. Uh, and then one that we might bring up is like well, comparing contrasting. Like I would just read, really, I would just finished like the children's homework with my oldest son, and as I'm yeah. watching that, I'm like, well, so here's these like mythic superheroes here's the marvel superheroes and then and, and yeah. i wonder if it's fair to call those like american mythology maybe in which case i'm like well uh how do you how do you weigh them out and this and again uh you know well well this is this is the this is the great project of our of our time i think yeah. um i and I'm, I'm thinking that more and more i was i used to think of it more in the abstract but the last few weeks i've had to go into barnes and noble a few times with my kids and i've had to i've chosen to uh it's been great um because that's what i've loved that's what i love to do as a kid myself or going to the library and choosing sort of having free reign of, of choosing whatever i want from whatever section i want that's no longer a reality that is safe for my kids i can't actually let them go and choose whatever they want um the vast majority of things in the in the young adult section or in the children's section is not just um not just not good it's uh, it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous. And much of it is just evil. It's just plain evil. Um, so I, you and I, Reese, we're going to have to have a, uh, have to be very serious about, you know, populating the, the next, the next centuries Barnes and Noble with the kinds of stories that are going to rebuild our culture because the stuff that's out there, I mean, it is, it is really, really bad. <laughs> Well, and I'm not talking right. about Harry Potter, my friend. I'm not. Right, right, I mean, right, Harry right. Potter is is, a, is great. Like, bring, like more Harry Potter, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I appreciate a lot about the Harry Potter universe and like what. Um, I mean, it's it that that one was cool because there, there's these like dark forms, but uh, yeah. I mean, if you, if you know to look for like the, the like the embedded hope and the embedded redemption in it, I mean, it. Yeah, I, I think it's. Oh, it's hard. there, and oh. it's because she she follows the old structures really well and she she plays with them in a very interesting ways i mean this is one of the reasons why it's so it's so popular because yeah. kids love it they respond they respond to it instinctively because they interest these are these are the stories that they grew up with yeah that makes sense well that definitely makes me feel excited to keep up with the writing even if it's like yes a, par a paragraph at a time it's okay so. that's how we do it that's one why we do it time, one sentence at a yeah. time <laughs> yes it's good for me it changes me hopefully it helps change somebody else in a good direction also someday so. yeah we gotta yeah but that's outside of our control we gotta do we gotta do what we can do and then leave the rest up to him <laughs> indeed indeed um for the listener who may want to follow your work or support future kickstarters or um pick up you know son of the deathless uh where are some ways uh you can be found in the world or online yeah the best way is just to go to my website nicholaskotar.com and sign up for my newsletter. That's that's where I let everybody know about the many, many crazy things I do. So easily, easily done. Just go to the front page and you'll immediately be prompted with some free books that you can get. And uh, then you'll you'll be in the community. And it's a fun place. It is fun, indeed. Uh, there are quite a few cool products coming from there. So There are, yes. I'm very excited. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, thanks so much for, for, for your time and for, uh, bringing some ideas and, uh, and thank you for your work in shaping the storytelling community. I, I'm, I'm definitely benefit, benefiting from that and I appreciate your well, work. So. Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. I'm glad I could be here. It's, it's been an interesting few months, but finally, finally you got me pinned down. So I'm glad. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> cool deal. All right. Well, thank you. Journey is a podcast by Moses Bernabe. If you like what you hear, consider supporting the show with dollars, reviews, or shares, or all of the above. Word and Journey can be found on most major podcast platforms and on my author Patreon at patreon.com slash Moses Bernabe. Moses Bernabe can be found at MosesBernabe.com. 
Contact info for my most excellent co-hosts can be found in the liner notes. The podcast logo was designed by TJ Todd, with additional development by Moses Bernabe. The theme music is by Aaron Esparza. This episode was mastered by Breakfast Puppies. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>